Before we start on carbohydrate metabolism, I'd just like to remind you of something that I think is really uh, a wonderful integrative device. A student ran across this in another context and wasn't aware it was already available as a link, so I thought maybe other people might not know about it as well. If you go into the links heading on ICON, there are a number of different links, but these in here called Inner Life of a Cell are really wonderful animations of the interior of the cell and allow you to see in kind of a concrete, put-together way um, the various things we've been talking about. And it's both available with a music on score, which for some reason it won't play here. It's wonderful. And then a narration that's more didactic and so forth. But I did want you to know about that. Before we move ahead into carbohydrates, um, do people have any questions about the overview of metabolism that we went through on Friday? Okay. Um, I have this here as uh, just a sort of a little squib of something that um, is an example of how silly some non-scientists non can get when they talk about sort of pseudoscience. Um, in this case, it's not just uh, an idea in their mind. They're making money off of this. And this wonderful cell food is um, something that has a way of its unique ability to dissociate water molecules within the body, resulting in the release of abundant nascent oxygen and hydrogen directly to the cells. And all of you remember from our discussions earlier on that all that means is that water dissociates into protons and hydroxyl groups. So try not to let them take too much of your money. All right. We are going to be covering Chapter 10 in two lectures rather than three. Three was always kind of ample, but I wanted to give people time to kind of absorb glycolysis. Because of the snow day, we're going to use two, two instead. And I'll try to point out as we go along the things that I'm not going to focus on this year as part of trimming off material so that it's not too much to absorb uh, overall. Uh, glucose is really at the heart of metabolism in a number of ways. Um, we use it for energy. Uh, we're going to look at the glycolytic pathway and how we can get energy from glucose in the absence of oxygen or anaerobically. We're going to look at how it's uh, further used as a fuel for oxidative respiration, which is where most of our, our energy comes from since we're aerobic organisms. Glucose is important for storage. Um, and we're going to look at glycogen and how it's made and how it's broken down. It's used as structure, not by us directly, because we're not plants, uh, but it's still very important, and we'll touch on some of those. It's a precursor. The carbon backbones of, of gla uh, glucose end up in basically everything else, and we're going to show how that can be. And finally, glucose is an important source of reducing power, uh, reducing power that can be used for biosynthetic purposes, not just for producing energy. And the reducing power for biosynthetic purposes will come from a pathway called the pentose phosphate shunt. Uh, and we'll look at that a bit too. So a very, very versatile central molecule. <clears throat> so this is a, a taking a look at uh, glucose through the uh, perspective of that metabolic map, looking at one specific example of it. So in this case, the polymers will be polysaccharides of one kind or another. We're going to be breaking them down into monosaccharides or using monomers to make polysaccharides. Once those monosaccharides get broken a little bit further, we're going to have two and three carbon intermediates. Um, and that breaking down process of the smaller intermediates will yield some NADH, uh, the reduced form for oxidative phosphorylation and energy production. Uh, but most of those two and three carbon intermediates are going to get fed into the citric acid cycle. Uh, and that's where the biggest part of the breakdown of <coughs> glucose is going to happen. Um, that produces a lot more NADH. Um, and in the process of the citric acid cycle, it will be broken down to carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide can get taken up through photosynthesis to make two and three carbon fragments. Uh, we'll be doing photosynthesis separately, but the pathways that we're looking at in this chapter, <coughs> excuse me, will turn out to have an awful lot of overlap with the pathways for photosynthesis. <clears throat> it also turns out that even we can take uh, three carbon fragments and build a monosaccharide out of it. And we're going to look at that process in gluconeogenesis. 
Um, that particular breakdown of, gly of glycogen is something called phosphorolysis, and we'll take a look at that as a specific unusual way of breaking things down. This is the first place where we're starting to look at metabolic pathways. And before we actually get into this pathway or these pathways, I want to share with you some questions to ask about any metabolic pathway as a way to organize the material so that you know you've got a handle on it. Some of the things you should be able to answer for a pathway are what is its function or functions in the cell? What do you put into it? What are the inputs? What are the products? Does it cost or does it produce ATP? Uh, are there steps along the way that involve either oxidation or reduction? Is there, how is it regulated? Almost all pathways are regulated, and the few that aren't are kind of interesting in their own right. Is it like other pathways? How, once you learn this one, are you part way towards understanding some other one? So these are general questions to be asking yourself about any set of metabolic pathways. Um, and you can sort of use this as a checklist through this one and the following ones. <clears throat> So before we actually um, get into glycolysis itself, we probably need to do at least a little bit of thinking about carbohydrate structure. We've done quite a bit about uh, DNA and protein and lipid structure. We haven't done nearly as much about carbohydrate structure, and it's hard to understand metabolism without knowing what something is made out of. Sugars in general are polyalcohols. They're carbon backbones with a lot of alcohol groups off of them. And they come, many of them, in at least two flavors, if you like. They can either come out as linear molecules or as ring molecules. Now, both of these representations are what we call projections. That is, they're not exact drawings that preserve the angles amongst the carbons and the hydrogens and so forth. Um, that kind of realistic diagram tends to be hard to look at once you get above a few atoms. So these are both conventions for how to, how to represent sugars um, in a somewhat simpler way that still captures the important geometrical information. Uh, they, they do capture the fact that many sugars can exist in either a linear or a ring form. And what's interesting about this conversion between a linear form and the ring form is that when this linear form closes, and so the, this is, as it happens, is glucose, and what's going to happen is a bond is going to be made uh, between this oxygen and this carbon. Right? And when that ring closure happens, uh, it can happen in one of two ways. It can happen with a newly formed uh, OH group pointing down or with a newly formed OH group pointing up. Uh, those are, if you like, more or less equivalent. They're not exactly equivalent, but they're really largely a random question about why they form one way or the other. What we call these two forms that differ only at that carbon that's been made into a, 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 a different carbon in the process of closing the ring is an anomer. So this is the alpha anomer and the beta anomer. They're both glucose. They only differ in whether that alcohol is pointing down for the alpha or up for the beta. It's going to turn out to be tremendously important whether it's pointing down or up. It's the difference between being able to eat it or dying of starvation or wearing it. Um, so we'll see why in a second. <clears throat> now, it turns out that glucose as a sugar has some interesting properties. Uh, glucose is a hexose, six-carbon sugar. Um, and glucose uh, has unique to it certain conformational properties. In the ring shape, uh, sugars uh, can be drawn as, or, or can take on, either what's called a chair configuration or a boat configuration, where they're both flipped up. And as you can imagine, the chair configuration is extending things apart from each other a bit more. It's a little bit more relaxed. Glucose is unique in that it is the only one of the sugars in which its alcohol groups are all at the equator in the chair conformation. So they are putting those alcohol groups sort of as far away as possible, if you like, from the center of the molecule. We don't have any direct way of proving it, but this may well be significant as to why glucose has dominated metabolism the way it has. Now, you remember I said that that first sugar in the ring closure could form in one of two ways, the alpha or the beta anomer with alcohol up or down. 
When you make a polymer of glucose, when you string multiple glucose molecules head to tail, those glucose ring structures, of, maybe I should mention, you only make polymers out of the ring structure. The linear forms are not made into polymers. When you put multiples of those rings together, the sugars you're putting in might have been alpha glucoses or beta glucoses. They might have had that alcohol pointing down or up. And so depending on which way it is, you now have a, a, a difference in the polymer that's due only to that anomeric carbon, where that oxygen was pointing. And if you're using all alpha um, anomers, you have an alpha D-glucose polymer, uh, which we would call starch or glycogen. If, by contrast, it was the beta anomer, um, uh, the, the, the total number of atoms is the same, but now the polymer is called cellulose. So that anomeric carbon is the only difference between starch and, and, and cellulose, or, or glycogen and cellulose. And this can show you how uh, dramatic that anomeric thing can be. This is what cellulose fibers would look like in a plant cell wall. Well, okay, so now we have anomers. Does that really make a difference? Yeah, so take a look here. This is a drawing now showing you the polymers uh, as showing a larger fraction of the polymer, sort of a lower magnification. The beta-1,4 linkages are found in linear polymers uh, in cellulose. And the cellulose molecules can hydrogen bond from side to side so that the cellulose molecules are zipped together in sheets. By contrast, the alpha-1,4 linkages can give you um, uh, more open uh, and branched polymers, such as starch or glycogen. Uh, starch is often lightly branched. Uh, glycogen is more heavily branched, um, so that the cellulose is of them the densest and the, the one that is the most occupied by just the glucose, whereas both of these molecules tend to be hydrated. There's room in those molecules for water to bind to them. And we see this even at the level of uh, what might be called secondary structure. So here's a comparison of starch and glycogen. These are, again, alpha-1,4 linkages. So it's an alpha anomer uh, on one of the sides of it. They make a right-handed helical polymer. And in these diagrams, you can see the little rings here of the glucose uh, spiraling around up. Um, given the shape of this, some of the uh, uh, hydrogen bonds are available to interact with water. It can be hydrated. Uh, this interior here is big enough to fit an iodine atom. And so if you've ever done a starch test, that atom, that iodine atom fits into that interior and changes its spectral properties. Um, if you take um, a starch molecule that's branched and you boil it, it opens up, com becomes completely hydrated, and now its size is much bigger, and that's why gravy thickens. Um, and you can also use it as a starting point for, for uh, beer, if you're so interested. Uh, glycogen is... At the, at the smaller level, very similar to starch. It's sometimes even called animal starch. Uh, it's alpha-1,4 linkages, but it's much more highly branched than, than the starch that's made by plants. In the case of cellulose, the beta-1,4 linkages orient the potential hydrogen bonding in different positions, and now all those potential hydrogen bonds are completely occupied or, or satisfied by other molecules of cellulose. Um, and that's why cellulose is so insoluble and so strong. Um, so you can think about it this way of saying that glucose polymers actually have secondary structure. They're either helical or sheet-like. In other words, he, you know, we know that in proteins you have alpha helices and beta sheets. We know that in nucleic acids you have the double helices and so forth. So what's interesting about the glucose polymers is they have secondary structure. They have the right-handed helices of the starch and so on, or the sheets of glucose, of cellulose, sorry, of cellulose. What they don't have is tertiary structure. Since carbohydrate polymers are a multiple of sizes and so on, they don't have a fixed tertiary structure. So they can have a secondary structure without really having anything significant as primary structure because they're all glucose or really having tertiary structure either. <clears throat> 
So sort of a side light that if you're packing a lot of stuff biologically, basically the only things you can do with it are helices and sheets. So you should always be looking for that. I'm going to pass over this uh, since we're a little shorter on time. You might find this of interest to read on your own and to use as a thought problem. Okay. So we talked about glycogen and starch as polymers of alpha-1 uh, D-glucose. And as long as the glucose is in those stores, they're useless to us, we need them for energy. How do you get the glucose back out of the glycogen? Well, through a process called glycogenolysis. Olysis is going to tell you it's breaking it down. Uh, glycogen, the breaking down of the glycogen molecule. And glycogen molecule gets its name because it can give rise to sugar. But it's a little odd. It's specifically a thing called phosphorolysis. So the enzyme is called glycogen phosphorylase. And it can add an inorganic phosphate directly across that bond. And the product of it then is a glucose 1-phosphate. So instead of adding water across the bond, as hydrolysis does, we add an inorganic phosphate. And for our efforts, we now have uh, a phosphorylated sugar, glucose 1-phosphate. An enzyme called phosphoglucomutase that we'll see again later um, can turn glucose 1-phosphate into glucose 6-phosphate, so not very different. Um, and if you're in the liver, uh, this glucose 6-phosphate can then be released, oh my goodness, that came out oddly, uh, to the bloodstream uh, through an enzyme called glucose 6-phosphatase, which will split that phosphate off and release a glucose into the bloodstream. Um, in all the other tissues that have glycogen and have glycogen phosphorylase, the glucose 6-phosphate that's released in this process is used locally. It's only the liver that's going to produce glucose for uh, general consumption. Any questions? Okay. All right. Now we can actually talk about glycolysis. Glycolysis is a very old piece of metabolism. Um, it's older than oxygen in the atmosphere because it's a perfectly adequate pathway in the absence of oxygen. Almost all organisms have glycolysis. Um, when we look at it, sort of the broad view, it's a 10-step pathway whose purpose is to take one molecule of glucose that has six carbons and to produce two molecules of pyruvate, which are each three carbons, and in the process produce two ATP. Um, it will also be reducing uh, two NAD molecules to NADH, the reduced form. And what happens to that is going to vary. We're going to see how it varies. We can also break down glycolysis into two major parts, into the first part in which we have to put energy into the pathway, and then the second part where we can get energy out of the pathway. So this is definitely a place where you have to invest in order to get a payoff. The other thing about glycolysis is that so many of its intermediates can, in fact, participate as compounds in other pathways. So this is one of the other reasons why glycolysis is often drawn as that central pathway on those huge wall charts in metabolism. Let's take a quick look at the energy investment phase of glycolysis. So you start off with a glucose molecule. You can see here your six-carbon sugar. You add an ATP uh, to add a phosphate up here with the enzyme hexokinase. Enzyme tells you its name. Now you have a glucose 6-phosphate. Uh, second enzyme, phosphoglucose isomerase, is, again, an explanatory thing. It's going to rearrange that phosphoglucose into a phosphofructose. And here's the picture of phosphofructose. Um, this is fructose 6-phosphate. Now, fructose is a five-membered ring, you can see. We invest a second ATP here with the enzyme phosphofructokinase. So that's telling you that this enzyme has phosphofructose, this guy, as its substrate, and it's going to add another phosphate. So far, we're investing two ATPs with nothing to show for it. And now we have uh, a 
uh, bisphosphorylated sugar, fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. And it kind of looks like it has a flag at each end. It's got a phosphate on one and the phosphate on the sixth position. <clears throat> this six carbon bisphosphorylated sugar is now set up for an enzyme that can split it in half, an enzyme called aldolase. And it's going to give us uh, two three carbon fragments, each of which has a phosphate on it. This is uh, glyceraldehyde three phosphate, dihydroxyacetone phosphate, um, and so these are two three carbon fragments. And then the last part of this energy investment phase can be considered triose phosphate isomerase. Um, again, it tells you what it's going to do. These are both trioses, the three carbon fragments that are with lots of alcohols. They're triose phosphates. They each have a phosphate on them. So a triose phosphate isomerase can turn one of them into the other. Um, so e either one of these can be turned into the other uh, by this enzyme. So that's the overview of the energy investment stage, where we're putting in two ATP, and we end up with two three-carbon fragments that are each phosphorylated. Now, the using those ATPs has a number of interesting uh, functions. Uh, one is that it keeps the glucose and all the subsequent intermediates inside the cell. Uh, so this is a generic function of, of phosphorylation on, on intermediates. It also sets those, fraction, those molecules up for further reactions, either by tagging them so that they fit to certain enzymes or so that they are now capable of certain reactions that they couldn't undergo otherwise. In the second half, so to speak, of glycolysis, this is the energy payoff part, where we're going to actually get something to show for all the ATP we've invested. Uh, remember that we, we made two three-carbon fragments. And so we're going to go through here showing you what happens to a three-carbon fragment, but there's going to be two of these for every glucose you put in. Um, this first reaction is a very strange one, a very strange one. It's called glyceraldehyde three phosphate dehydrogenase, um, and it does do that. A dehydrogenase will usually end up producing some NADH, so something in there is getting oxidized because the NAD just got reduced. But it also uses inorganic phosphate. Um, so it's going to use uh, an oxidation to drive a phosphorylation with an inorganic phosphate. Not an ATP, just a plain old inorganic phosphate. And that will give us 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. Uh, so here you can see it. It's uh, got a phosphate at the one position and at the three position. This is a glycerate now because this is, uh, would be a uh, carboxylic acid if it didn't have that phosphate on it. Phosphoglycerate kinase um, is, we're going to see, named for the backwards direction. We can put ADP in here and get ATP out. We'll look at that in more detail in a little bit. Uh, but that's one, that we're starting to get some ATP back. And, and right now, we've cleared the cost. We put two ATP in at the top uh, because each of the two three carbon fragments will do this. We've got our ATP back. We're even now. And that would leave us with three phosphoglycerate. So here you have glycerate. There's the uh, carboxylic acid there. Three phosphoglycerate, the phosphate on the three position. A mutase is going to be able to move that phosphate around. So it's phosphoglycerate mutase and producing two phosphoglycerate. So it's just now on the two position. And then another oddly named enzyme, enolase. And what enolase can do is take a water molecule out. And when it does that, it makes this rather odd looking molecule phosphoenol pyruvate. Uh, so phosphoenol pyruvate has an odd name and it's an important player. What it's done is to set up the molecule so it now has enough potential energy to make more ATP. And in a reaction that's named backwards, phosphenopyruvate will give us ATP and plain old pyruvate at the end. Okay. Any questions about the overview before we start looking at these in a little more detail? Okay. So let's look at hexokinase. Um, hexokinase, transparent name, 
something that adds phosphates to hexoses, generally glucose, but it can do some other hexoses. Um, and you'll consume 1 ATP to make glucose 6 phosphate. We talked a little bit about how hexokinase closes when the substrates bind. Uh, very large negative delta G, so minus 17 kilojoules per mole. So this is, metabolically speaking, irreversible. This is a one-way step. You notice it has a one-way arrow there. I mentioned that this will help keep it into the cell because the charge there will no longer let it go back out through the glucose ca carrier. Um, you might remember that when we get glucose out of glycogen, it comes to us ready phosphorylated because phosphorolysis can add an inorganic phosphate across the bond and give us a phosphorylated sugar. So when we get glucose out of glycogen, we get a little higher energy yield per glucose for that reason. Phosphoglucose isomerase. Um, and you can see here that we're, all we're doing is, is changing a six-membered into a five-membered ring, still have a phosphate on the six position. Um, the rest of this looks uh, similar between the three sugars, just rearranged it uh, so that this is now flapping up in the breeze. <clears throat> the free energy change associated with here is very close to zero, um, and it's considered freely reversible um, for that reason. We call glucose an aldose because it has an aldehyde here. We call, fru oops, we call fructose a ketose because it has a carbonyl carbon there. Okay. Now we get to a, an important enzyme, a big important enzyme, phosphofructokinase. We talked about this a little bit when we were talking about enzyme kinetics, partly because it's a big one. Phosphofructokinase takes that fructose 6-phosphate that we just made, invests the second ATP, and there we have fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. A pretty symmetrical, pretty close to symmetrical looking uh, molecule. So again, we're investing a high energy bond off that ATP. It's again, metabolically irreversible. This is a very highly regulated enzyme. Phosphofructokinase is a key point in this pathway. Um, we call it the committed step. And it's the committed step in the sense that glucose can start down glycolysis but until it hits phosphofructokinase, there are other places it could go. And so phosphofructokinase is a good target for regulation because it, it's the place at which you still have some decisions to make about where you're going to go. It's also an important place for regulation because it costs energy. So that's always going to be a concern for the cell. Some of the signs that this is regulated and regulated in ways that reflect its function ADP, which is its product, can increase the binding of F6P, fructose 6-phosphate. And that makes sense because ADP is a signal that the cell is, is lower on energy. Um, phosphovenylpyruvate is the end product of glycolysis. You remember that's the, or not quite the end, it's near the end of glycolysis. Um, if it's accumulating, then it's abundant. We don't need to use this part of the pathway anymore. It decreases uh, fructose 6-phosphate binding and decreases enzyme activity. In us, in mammals, there's a, another compound called fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, which is even more important for regulation, and we'll look at that in just a little bit. Um, this is sort of a table showing you some of the different kinds of regulators. Um, it's not just ADP, but GDP or AMP. These are all what we call positive effectors that are going to increase the output of the enzyme. Um, they're all markers for low energy status. Uh, fructose 2,6-bisphosphate is a, a small molecule that's under the control of hormones, and so it allows for regulation of this pathway across the whole body. Negative effectors are things that are going to decrease the output of the pathway. We mentioned phosphenylpyruvate, which is internal to glycolysis. Uh, citrate or fatty acids are both things that can be used as fuels. If they're abundant, then you've got energy from them. You don't need to break down sugars in glycolysis. You've got the energy. You've got it somewhere else, so don't use glycolysis so much. 
And similarly, ATP levels rising means you've got the energy you need. Why don't you use this glucose to make fat or to make glycogen or something like that? Um, we've seen this graph before. Um, you can see that in the absence of, or not absence, but in lower concentrations of ATP, we have uh, hyperbolic kinetics with a fairly high affinity or a small KM. And with increasing ATP, that curve is now shifted to the right. The affinity is lower, it takes more to half saturate it, and it has sigmoidal kinetics. So it has um, the more cooperative behavior. Uh, interesting, and we, we can see this at a structural level if we look at uh, phosphofructokinase. Phosphofructokinases are almost always multimeric enzymes. They'll have catalytic sites, places where the fructose, uh, you know, substrates can bind and the ATP can bind to be a substrate. They'll have additional sites elsewhere that can act as allosteric sites where no enzymatic activity is going to happen but the binding of things in those places will change the activity at the catalytic sites. So it's a very good example of an allosteric enzyme. Uh, that AMP could reverse ATP makes sense. AMP is a good sign that you're lower on energy. Um, and because of the uh, opposite effects of those two compounds, the ratio of AMP to ATP becomes a measure for energy status of the cell overall. Um, and AMP is a better marker than ADP, you may remember, because adenylate kinase can take two ADPs and make an ATP and an AMP out of them. So um, another marker for the kind of the tying together of all the pathways is that uh, pro uh, protons, free protons, can inhibit the enzyme since under uh, extravagant anaerobic exercise conditions, lactic acid can start to accumulate. The, uh, the protons inhibiting the phosphofructokinase keeps you from going overboard and poisoning your, your muscles with lactic acid. Um, you mentioned already that citrate is a sort of a, a sign that energy abund is, is abundant. These are showing some of these um, uh, 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 allosteric effectors in bacteria, so you have fructose 6-phosphate uh, going to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, um, and some of the feedbacks that we've talked about so far. Um, in us, this molecule is more, more important probably than the effectors in the bacteria. Uh, fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, so it has a second phosphate in it, but it's in a different position. It's a different enzyme that makes it. So phosphofructokinase 2, you can think of it as either the second phosphofructokinase or the phosphofructokinase that adds phosphate at the 2 carbon. They're both true. But this compound can bind at allosteric sites on phosphofructokinase and make the enzyme more active. We've seen these diagrams before. They're sort of a, a highlight the interplay, the crosstalk between the different metabolites. Um, this is the, the graph for fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, the purely allosteric regulator of how it increases uh, the um, affinity and uh, changes the shape of the kinetics for this curve. Same Vmax still, uh, but much, much greater affinity uh, for the substrate when you look at the different concentrations of fructose 6-phosphate. And in this graph, we're looking at the interplay between ATP and now the, the purely allosteric effector of fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. In the absence of the positive effector of F2P, you can have initial rise in activity and then, in effect, a self-inhibition. And the more of the allosteric effector, positive effector of F2P, um, the greater and greater ability the enzyme has to overcome the inhibition of the ATP. There is a separate enzyme that makes fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. Um, and what's interesting is there's a part of that enzyme that then breaks it down. Whenever you have an on signal in biology, you have an off signal. Um, so the phosphofructokinase 2 domain makes more phosphofructokinase uh, 
fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. Uh, and this phosphatase domain will cut that off so that you can turn the signal off. Um, and then the rest of the, the molecule is taken up with regulatory domains that can be further manipulated by the cell. All right. So now we've got fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, a, a bisphosphorylated sugar, sugar with two phosphates on it. Uh, and we're, we're not quite there yet. We want to get down and have three carbon pieces to, to play around with. The next enzyme and pathway is called aldolase, which is not a very obvious name given the way we usually look at it, which is as something that can take fructose 1,6-bisphosphate and split it into two three-carbon pieces. It gets its name because it can also take those three-carbon pieces and condense it in an aldol condensation into a six-carbon molecule. So aldolase gets its name, uh, in a sense, from the backward reaction. Aldolase does not really want to go in the direction that it, tends, it, it, it will in glycolysis. Look at the, neg the standard free energy change. The standard free energy change, meaning when you set it up under standard conditions, is very positive. In other words, under standard conditions, it's going to make fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. But those are not the conditions in the cell. The actual conditions in the cell are very different. And so in the context, ah, sorry here, in the context of the cell, the free energy change is a little bit less than zero, and so it goes forward. And that's because the products of this enzyme are consumed so rapidly. So this is a dramatic example of where the standard free energy change and the actual free energy change are really quite different. Both of its products are trioses, and if we look at the structure of them, we'll sort of um, see why they're called it. So the phosphate part is obvious. They each have phosphates. This is dihydroxyacetone. You can recognize that central uh, carbonyl carbon as the center of an acetone molecule with an alcohol at each end, so it's dihydroxyacetone. Here's glyceraldehyde. Well, glycerol would be three alcohols. This is an aldehyde group here, so glyceraldehyde with a 3-phosphate. Okay. Um, when we have three lectures to discuss this, this area, I take some time to look at enzyme mechanisms. And for the most part this year, I'm going to leave most of the enzyme mechanisms aside unless I emphasize them. In the case of aldolase, I would like you to notice two things about it. Um, it has this active site that includes um, uh, lysine uh, and um, tyrosines. It's going to be able to participate in acid-base catalysis, and it involves covalent catalysis. So this is a second example for us compared to chymotrypsin, where there's both kinds of catalysis in a single enzyme of acid-base catalysis as well as a covalent catalysis. Um, since we don't have the full three days to talk about it, I'm not going to go into detail on these, but those of you who um, like enzymes and enzyme mechanisms are certainly invited to look in more detail. There's the um, tyrosine that's going to become uh, uh, I'm sorry, no, the tyrosine that's going to be part of the uh, acid-base catalysis. So the lysine is the one that becomes covalently attached. So let's move on to, to panel 26. Um, so now we have two three-carbon fragments. Only one of those two is useful for the rest of glycolysis. So the, the dihydroxyacetone phosphate that we just made is not by itself any use for the rest of glycolysis. We have to turn it into glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. Um, and that's done by an enzyme called triose phosphate isomerase, whose name is really transparent. Um, this has been described as a catalytically perfect enzyme, that it's very close to the rate at which collisions happen, that the catalysis happens. Um, the free energy change associated with this is actually about slightly positive, but glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate is consumed very rapidly. And so that helps to draw the reaction in the direction of this way rather than the other way. Okay. 
All that we've been talking about up to this point is the energy investment stage where we're putting in ATP and setting it up so that three carbon fragments can do something exciting for us. Now we're going to start getting some payoff. We're going to get some actual energy out of these things after all this work into them. Everything from now on is going to, are going to be trioses. Um, this second part of it will produce four ATP altogether. Remember, we invested two ATP to get it started, to get up to the fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. So that's going to net us two ATP per glucose, one ATP per triose, two ATP per glucose. If we got our glucose out of glycogen, it would be three ATP per glucose because we would not have had to invest in ATP through hexokinase. Now, what's interesting is this second phase is more conserved than the top part. So the second phase is uh, either there's fewer ways of doing it or it's a more ancient part of the pathway, but it is the most uh, similar amongst organisms. And there are organisms who have the second phase without having the first phase. So what's going to happen? Okay. Glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogenase has a really awful name for a really exciting enzyme. It's going to do something very odd. It's going to uh, reduce this NAD to an NADH, or if you like, it's going to oxidize that carbon, and it's going to use inorganic phosphate to phosphorylate it, so you end up with a 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. So you'd have a three-carbon sugar that's got two phosphates hanging off of it. It looks quite odd. So this is going to be a way in which we can add an inorganic phosphate to a molecule, not through using any kind of nucleotides, but driving it by an oxidation reduction reaction. And it's worth taking a little bit of a look at that. Um, that glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate is going to be oxidized and phosphorylated. Um, the, uh, trying to decide whether, how much we want to get into here. So you can see here in this active site, you have a cysteine that's going to be part of the active site. You have an NAD plus that's bound there. Um, the sulfur is, is going to be able to attack and make a covalent attachment there. And so there's going to be a covalent intermediate there uh, with the glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. This covalent intermediate is what's going to actually be the place where um, oxidation reduction is going to go on. And so NAD plus is going to oxidize that covalent intermediate. It's going to rip electrons out of it um, and produce a thioester. So in, when those electrons have been taken off and put onto NAD+, you now have NADH over there, and you have a thioester that's covalently attached to the enzyme. Now, you may have heard the phrase thioester before. Remember that, acet that acetyl-CoA, uh, one of the common intermediates we talked about in the overview of metabolism, is a thioester and has the peculiar property that its energy is roughly equivalent to that of a, um, an ATP uh, terminal bond. Now, what's cute about this is that by going through a thioester intermediate, the enzyme does not have to go so far into the hole. If we were trying to do this without that covalent intermediate, there would be a very large free energy change to get from one place to the other. Having the thioester intermediate instead uh, makes the whole reaction pathway more doable. So we have here the, the thioester uh, intermediate. We, the enzyme can let go of the NADH, the reduced form, and pick up a fresh NAD+. Plus. And um, the enzyme has now set up with this thioester in there, and the inorganic phosphate now, this inorganic phosphate can come in and attack, and what comes off then will be the glyceraldehyde, 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. Um, so that inorganic phosphate releases it from the enzyme and in the process regenerates it for the next step.
Next enzyme in the pathway is called phosphoglycerate kinase. Um, this is one of the enzymes whose name goes backwards. I will try to flag these when you see them. Um, most enzyme names make sense one way or another. This one happens to be named for the backwards direction. What it actually does in our bodies most of the time, although we'll see that there are times it goes in the other direction, is to take 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate and an ADP and make plain old 3-phosphoglycerate and an ATP. Now, this is a phosphoglycerate. That's a, a carboxylic acid up there. That's clearly been oxidized compared to glyceraldehyde. So this is, the, this is where you can see that an oxidation reduction event happened, okay? It was visible before, but not as dramatic. Um, this particular um, uh, phosphate group on here, in effect, has a high energy bond on it. It's, it, is, it has a free energy of hydrolysis sufficient to drive that transfer to an ADP molecule. Um, this is a strongly favored reaction, uh, a free energy change of minus 19 kilojoules. And so this um, helps to pull forward the glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogenase. Glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogenase was doing something pretty weird anyhow. You, you wouldn't have expected it to really want to go forward, and it doesn't. It's got a slightly positive free energy change. But the phosphoglycerate kinase has such a negative one that it succeeds in pulling it through. And we've made ATP. We've made ATP. We call this substrate level phosphorylation. When you make ATP from another substrate, from an intermediate, that's called substrate level phosphorylation. And we're going to see that there are at least two other ways that cells can make ATP. There's oxidative phosphorylation, there's photophosphorylation. This is substrate level phosphorylation. <clears throat> Next one in is a simple minded enzyme, phosphoglycerate mutase. It can move 3 phosphoglycerate to 2 phosphoglycerate. Two molecules are pretty comparable. Um, we'll skip over the mechanism since we don't have real time. But this is freely reversible, and you wouldn't expect it to be terribly. Um, complicated. It happens to be one of the molecules that can use a histidine as part of its active site. Ah, and then we come to the enzyme enolase. And enolase is not necessarily a very transparent name. Um, what it can do is it can take a water molecule out of phosphoglycerate. So here you have two phosphoglycerate. And what enolase can do is abstract that hydrogen in this alcohol or this AOH group here and give you phosphoenol pyruvate. Um, so this is the ene group. If this didn't have a phosphate on it, it would be an alcohol, but it's a phosphoenol pyruvate. Um, you could think of this as an interesting molecule because it's got these positive charges near each other that create strain, or because it's managed to be fully oxidized at one end and uh, nearly fully reduced at the other. In any case, enolase can make that conversion. And now we have phosphoenol pyruvate, uh, the hero, one of the heroes of our story. Remember, it went back and could inhibit phosphofructokinase, the enzyme, as a way of saying, hey, guys, we've got enough. Um, but it's going to actually be the second step at which we can make ATP. Um, and so phosphoenol pyruvate plus an ADP molecule uh, and the enzyme pyruvate kinase gives us plain old pyruvate and ATP. So one thing of interest here is there's fully reduced end at one end, fully oxidized at the other end. This enzyme is named for the reverse reaction. Okay, this is named for the reverse reaction. This is our second substrate level uh, phosphorylation. And I'm not going to go into the detail of how the enzyme works on that. So... Um, Let's call that it for today, and I'll see y'all Wednesday.